So welcome everybody to this, the first installment of this year's Humane Philosophy Project, Ian Ramsey Center Seminar Series. We're really grateful as always to all the sponsors of this seminar series, which include the Ian Ramsey Center for Science and Religion at the University of Oxford, Blackfriars Hall, University of Oxford, the University of Warsaw, and the John Templeton Foundation. And uh, this year, where we're especially excited to be combining this series with our project, Science, Philosophy, and Theology, Central and Eastern European Perspectives, which is a, a kind of a Europe-wide academic networking uh, and interchange project. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you our first speaker, Professor Slobodan Perovic, who is an associate professor at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Belgrade. He was the chair of the, the department. Yeah. Are you still the chair For, of the department? Not, uh, fortunately Formerly not. Formerly the chair <laughs> of the department of the <laughs> philosophy at the University of Belgrade. He's published works on the history of philosophy, history and philosophy of quantum mechanics, epistemology of experiments in particle physics, metaphysical issues in modern biology, and the history and philosophy of cosmology. And today he's going to talk to us on the topic, orthodoxy and its alternatives in modern cosmology. So please give him a very warm welcome. Okay, thank you very much for this introduction and thank you uh, for inviting me actually to this uh, very interesting uh, speaker series. Uh, and it's really fitting actually to talk about cosmology uh, <clears throat> when the issue that you're exploring uh, in the speaker series is science, uh, theology, and uh, 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 philosophy. Uh, so I will start with one very nice quote from uh, Helge Krag's uh, Conceptions of Cosmos that I actually recommend if you uh, wish to start reading about the history of cosmology, that's probably the best place to uh, start. So he says, even when focusing on the scientific aspects of cosmology, as I do, one cannot ignore the philosophical and religions, religious dimensions, which for a long time were inextricably connected with scientists' efforts to unravel the secrets of the universe. This connection was particularly strong in the old days, especially before the Enlightenment period, after which it weakened. However, it never disappeared completely and probably never will. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is really one of the reasons why uh, uh, Helge Krag is probably correct in, in sort of characterizing uh, the nature of cosmology as uh, a science. In many ways, it's a unique science. Uh, in, in one way, it's probably the oldest of uh, the sciences. We all know that uh, all cultures have wondered about the structure and the uh, origin of the universe. Uh, but as a physical cosmology, as a science where you take and apply uh, the best theories about the nature uh, of the physical, uh, about the structure of the physical world that you have uh, to these questions and you try to uh, answer what is the structure and what is the origin of the universe using the best available uh, physical theories, in that sense, it's actually a very young science. It sort of originates uh, more or less around the Second World War. There are some uh, disagreements about it. Uh, before that, there was something like math mathematical cosmology, uh, where you took sort of theories and built various models based on the physical theories, such as general theory of relativity, or Newtonian uh, mechanics uh, uh, um, much earlier. Uh, but these were sort of models derived from these theories, right? Mathematical models of the structure of the universe and its various properties. Uh, the application of physics be uh, begins uh, uh, much later and sort of, uh, that, that's my main interest. This is what I'm going to talk about, the physical cosmology. Uh, <clears throat> Now, in the late 30s, uh, around the time when uh, physical cosmology sort of started developing as a scientific discipline, um, 
there was a debate between physicists on the actual nature of knowledge in cosmology, what kind of science it is, what are the parameters, epistemological parameters uh, that guide it as a science. Uh, and there were sort of two polarized camps uh, in that debate. Uh, this is a quote from one of those uh, camps uh, uh, by Edward Milne, the philosopher, he says, may take comfort from the fact that in spite of the much vaunted sway and dominance of pure observation and experiment in ordinary physics, world physics, cosmology, propounds questions of an objective non-metaphysical character which cannot be answered by observation uh, alone, he wants to say, but must be answered, if at all, by pure reason. Natural philosophy is something bigger than the totality of conceivable observations. So this is the view that when we are dealing with, uh, cos with cosmological questions, really it comes down to sort of pure reason, as Milne says, to determine the nature or the structure of the universe, its origin and, and its properties. Uh, he wasn't alone in sort of taking this uh, position, defending this position. Uh, Eddington, Dirac, and Jeans were among others. I mean, they disagreed on a number of things, but this is what they sort of agreed on. They were in the same camp, so to speak. And they were sort of labeled rationalist cosmophysicists by historians. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you had uh, uh, physicists who thought <coughs> that cosmology, like any other uh, discipline, sort of field of physics, uh, should really strive to the ideal of experimental evidence or something very close to experimental evidence. Uh, one of the physicists who defended this sort of openly against the views of, the, of this group was Herbert Dingle, and he even labeled what they were sort of defending a pseudoscience of inveterate cosmetology. So it was a very sharp uh, conflict or sort of intellectual conflict or debate with very polarized uh, uh, views. Now, I'm not going to defend either of these two, nor I think there are uh, as sharp uh, disagreements today. But uh, the truth, if you wish, is somewhere kind of in the middle, as I will try to uh, show today. So to use terminology that philosophers of science uh, like to use, um, there is underdetermination, which is of, of theories in cosmology by evidence, available evidence, which is pronounced, uh, uh, if you wish, in cosmology much more than in some other uh, areas of physics, especially in experimental physics. Uh, so let me just introduce sort of that idea, uh, by the way, of, of uh, uh, example. So uh, once uh, Edwin Hubble uh, discovered the redshift uh, in the spectrum of uh, uh, distant galaxies, he tried actually to uh, determine observationally whether that redshift is actually due to the expansion of the universe. Uh, using particular models, Friedman uh, models derived from uh, relativistic equations. And he actually collected data that he thought was relevant, uh, were relevant for that uh, purpose. Uh, however, he sort of failed uh, in that uh, quest. He couldn't really tell uh, based on these data at the time uh, that were available. So he concluded in a paper with his co-author in 1935 <coughs> He says it might be possible to explain the results on the basis of either a static homogeneous model with some unknown cause for the redshift or an expanding homogeneous model with introduction of effects from spatial curvature, which seems unexpectedly large but may not be impossible. In other words, you had two options and both options were uh, uh, adequately supported by the same uh, uh, set of data or observation. So you couldn't really decide. Now, uh, those pure reason uh, uh, guys would say, well, you know, uh, that's because you have to sort of decide and, uh, in the end based on the uh, sort of theoretical aspects of your model rather than uh, the evidence. The others would say, well, you have to search more 
in order to actually uh, refute one of uh, one or the other uh, model. Uh, in fact, if we look at what I would call uh, reconstructive sort of sciences, or sciences that reconstruct evidence uh, regarding something that happened uh, in the past and use uh, various observations to do so. Uh, so not only cosmology, but uh, disciplines like paleontology or archaeology would qualify as well, or uh, the quest for origin of life in, uh, uh, in biology as well. I mean, there are two uh, fairly obvious, I would say, uh, but I will offer you an argument why I think that is the case, characteristics of, of, these, uh, of knowledge in these sciences. First of all, the sort of underdetermination that you find in these uh, sciences is sort of pronounced usually and sort of long-lasting if you compare them to experimental sciences. And related to that, uh, typically the uh, sort of faith of your uh, orthodox or dominant view that you accept, uh, whether, for example, the universe is expanding or not, will closely depend uh, so, so the way that you treat it will closely depend on uh, uh, the way that you uh, regard and treat uh, uh, alternatives uh, that you have, so on the epistemic standing of the alternatives. And I will explain to you in sort of first half of the talk uh, kind of a philosophical general argument why I think this is so, and then I will give you a concrete example uh, from uh, uh, contemporary cosmology that I think nicely shows why this is the case. So, what does this really mean that uh, uh, your theories are sort of uh, uh, underdetermined in this sort of uh, uh, prolonged uh, uh, manner and in this uh, uh, sort of uh, emphasized manner? Well. If you actually think about it, what really the constraints of your evidence that you, so, so you have a body of evidence and you put certain constraints uh, uh, um, by interpreting them on, on the theoretical accounts that you have, that you can have of that evidence, what does, it, what does that really depend on? It really <laughs> depends on what we could call the robustness of testability. Uh, in other words, how accessible are the parameters that you're trying to test? You have a theoretical model and you have parameters in them. So how actually accessible are they? Can you, can you actually uh, see what you want to see? And not only that, but can you actually manipulate them, right? Can you control for these parameters or not? And to what extent you can manipulate them? That's really what's going to determine to what extent your uh, theories, theoretical models, are underdetermined by the evidence in the end of the day. Maybe other things, but this is actually crucial, especially in the case of cosmology. So let me explain it to you. Uh, so ideally, what you would want, you would want sort of maximally robust testability across all the physical scales so that you can and you, you can achieve that in some areas of physics, right? Uh, for example, in particle physics, uh, you know, electrons are all around us, so you can actually experiment uh, with the electrons. You can uh, uh, experiment with protons as well, or with light, with the uh, uh, matter, uh, the way that they interact. Then, once you sort of manipulate it to a sufficient extent, uh, uh, that kind of a phenomenon, you want to move on to sort of a lower scale, physical scale. For example, you want to manipulate, in some sense, uh, particles or the components from which protons are composed, right? And then you make experiments, you know, various detectors, detecting techniques, and you can also do that, you know, a bit more difficult, but you can actually do it. So. Ideally, you would want to do that at every possible physical scale. So, if we sort of measure accessibility of relevant parameters, uh, early particle physics uh, is uh, 
the param parameters are very accessible in a way, light is all around us, right? You can sort of experiment with it. Uh, electromagnetism, so magnetic and electric phenomena, uh, that's also sort of accessible, uh, uh, you know, at the sort of a kitchen table experimental apparatus. Uh, similarly, solid state physics, so you could say that the accessibility in this case is high. Then it gets trickier in, for example, high energy physics. Uh, yes, <clears throat> electrons and protons are all around us, but if you wish to actually collide them at particular, particular energies in order to see what's going on inside them, then you have a problem because it's not as easy to achieve these energy scales, right? However, in cosmology, accessibility is very challenging, right? It's very low. And for a number of reasons, so sort of you can say, there's probably more reasons, but two sort of uh, uh, stick out. So it's a historical science, right? You would want to experiment with various uh, uh, structures of the universe, various initial conditions, as you normally experiment with the physical phenomena, but you can't do that. You can't even access these initial conditions. And they're really crucial for sort of your knowledge of the evolution and the structure of the universe. Uh, also, you're just observing for a particular place in, in, in space and time. So really, you are constrained uh, to observe only a very particular slice of uh, space-time, right? And it's not even clear which slice it is. Theoretical accounts will tell you different things. And then, unlike in, say, particle physics, there is a very complex structure you deal with, right? You're dealing with the matter, all the matter that exists in various scales in the same time uh, of the universe. So you're going to have many parameters across scales, and there could be always a new parameter that will surprise you, right? In particle physics, you know, you have electrons and protons. I mean, there's only so much that can happen, actually, when, when you collide them. So that's the first sort of a challenge, accessibility, in terms of the uh, our robustness uh, of, of testability of, of the phenomena that cosmology is interested in. How about manipulability? Well, usually when we talk about manipulating physical phenomena, I mean, the sort of a regular distinction is between observations and experiments, right? Observations are something where you sort of sit down and you observe passively something that's kind of uh, 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 either close to you or far from you and so on. And then experiments are uh, 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 observations where you can actually manipulate uh, your phenomenon, you know, uh, take, take it apart or collide things and so on, and then uh, draw inferences. But it's not really like that, right? I mean, there's a continuum between uh, the two and it goes sort of, I mean, you can manipulate things already at the level of, or at the side of the observer as much as you can at the level of the phenomenon. So when you use a telescope, right, you will actually focus uh, your lenses and uh, you will put it somewhere where there is very uh, uh, little background light uh, or back, uh, uh, light pollution or uh, the, the conditions, you'll pick conditions with steady air and so on. So you're already manipulating things at the observer's end, so to speak. You can manipulate time, uh, wait for the phenomenon to appear at a particular sort of a point in time, and then sort of draw your conclusions. Uh, that's also something that sort of observer is really doing. This is actually a picture of uh, Aristotle's experiment where he took uh, 21 eggs and uh, each egg one day older than the previous one and then cut them open to see how the embryo actually uh, 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 develops. I mean, that's what he did in effect. He manipulated sort of a time scale rather than the phenomenon itself. You can also manipulate space as an observer. So, for example, parallax angle uh, with the help of which we determine the distance to uh, 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 celestial objects, and you can determine distance of other objects too on, on Earth, 
So you make a measurement at one point uh, in Earth's or orbit and you wait you know, half a year to get to the opposite uh, point, uh, make measurements and then you determine the parallax. You effectively are doing that also as an observer. Then it gets kind of in this gray area more. For example, you can have instrument surrogates. Uh, the recent one is gravitational lensing where gravitation bends around the object that, so you have an object which is obscured by a, a large or, or uh, a object which is closer to you, but you can actually, thanks to the bending of light, see the object behind it as this kind of a, a, a ring of light. You can uh, uh, analyze that light, its spectrum, and find out what's behind, right? It serves as your sort of a, a instrument, a surrogate of your instrument. Sometimes they compare it with this thing with the wine glass, but it's actually not a good analogy, physically speaking. Then uh, you can use surrogate labs. You can have various ideas about the nuclear synthesis in the cores of stars, and then you can scan the sky to see what's coming out of various stars and to see, to sort of test your models uh, with the outcomes of these sort of natural laboratories. So you can do a lot on the side of the server observer. Uh, and then we have sort of manipulation at the level of full-scale experimentation, what we would normally call experimentation. Like in mechanics, you can manipulate all the sort of uh, in, uh, uh, um, parameters that you are interested in. You can control them, right, do the controlled uh, experiments. In particle physics, as I said, you know, until maybe 30 or 40 years ago, now it gets in, it's getting uh, harder to manipulate phenomena. That's what we would call experiments. I mean, where do you draw the line exactly? I mean, I don't know, and really, who cares where exactly is the line? <laughs> so, uh, again, cosmology is a sort of, a, there's a historical aspect of, of physical cosmology, right? And then, as a result, you will have not only low accessibility, but low to maybe moderate manipulability. Uh, you cannot really surround your events with the detectors. You cannot really... Then, you're not only dealing with various scales, uh, uh, physical scales, but with stages in the evolution of the universe. So you can't really access all the stages either, especially the earlier ones. Uh, and then you can only use sort of uh, the experiments that particle physicists are doing uh, on the ground or maybe some of the cosmic radiation uh, data indirectly to do, draw sort of indirect conclusions about the properties that you are actually interested in. So it's a very challenging task for cosmologists. Now, how is this really related to, and this is sort of the main kind of a point, to the epistemic standing of alternatives. You have a sort of a dominant, you have, or you have a sort of number of various accounts, theoretical accounts or models uh, concerning various proper properties of the universe. Well, this is what sort of a, a, a non-robust stability that you have in cosmological results in it it sort of provides a really wide space for alternative accounts. Why is that the case? Well, if you think about it, if you have parameters which are either testable with low manipulability or not really testable like initial conditions of, of the universe, uh, you can sort of somehow simulate them in a number of different theoretical models. Uh, uh, without really, I mean, it will take a long time to increase the robustness of testability uh, to be able to do what the experimental uh, uh, physicists are doing to sort of refute uh, 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 decisively particular uh, theoretical accounts, right? You will have many options uh, 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 normally. Then also, what makes it even more uh, challenging is the sort of complexity of the structure that you are dealing with, because you will have sort of disagreements. What is the basic scale or stage in the evolution of the universe, right? 
whether it's uh, evolving at all, really, in, in a sort of substantial sense. So, uh, uh, in a way, sort of to put it simply, you're going to have uh, theoretical disagreements all around based on one sort of a, a unique body of evidence, right? You can develop a number of uh, plausible accounts. You will have disagreement on what is actually a fundamental theory, what is a fundamental scale or stage that we are dealing with. And then within these fundamental theories, you're going to have disagreements and sort of variations of that theories. Uh, oops. This applies. I mean, I talked about... Oops. <laughs> what do I... Uh, I talked about uh, mentioned observations, experiments. This applies to simulation, computer simulations uh, uh, of uh, relevant phenomena as well, because you know you have a wide sort of space for inserting various, plausibly inserting various uh, um, theoretical parameters with respect to the sort of in, when you are interpreting and trying to simulate a uh, uh, um, particular. Uh, piece of evidence, observation. So let me give you an example uh, of this. And it's an example that is usually regarded as as close to the sort of a kind of experimental evidence that we find in physics. I mean, you will see it sort of in the textbook, textbook presentations, this is uh, usually portrayed as analogous to the sort of experimental evidence uh, that's the discovery of cosmic microwave background radiation uh, that was discovered by Penzias and Wilson with this large antenna. They didn't know, actually, initially that they discovered it. They thought it was some kind of a noise they couldn't really uh, get around with for, for a long time, actually. Uh, but then it turned out uh, that uh, it's fits really nicely with the so-called hot Big Bang uh, models of the uh, uh, evolution of the universe. Uh, and that's the standard interpretation now, that the cosmic microwave background, which is really this uh, radiation coming from all sides uh, at about 3 Kelvin uh, uh, temperature, and you can actually detect it even on the one of the radio, uh, uh, wave, regular radio waves. Uh, it was interpreted uh, by Dickey and others, and uh, before that by a couple of uh, uh, Soviet scientists in 1964, as a remnant of the primordial fireball, actually, the, the Big Bang. So, uh, in, in this region, if the Big Bang happened uh, here, uh, very quickly, uh, what happened is that uh, a sort of a entire universe uh, looked like a cloud, sort of plasma, analogous to plasma in a sort of ga gas discharge lamp, as if somebody turned it on. And then you had photons that were very uh, uh, frequently uh, scattering off uh, the matter of the electrons. Uh, so they couldn't really travel freely through the universe, so it, the, the universe was not really transparent to light. It was uh, this sort of a coupling of radiation or light and uh, matter. Uh, at some point, uh, due to the expansion uh, of the universe, there was actually the last scattering of uh, the photons, they scattered off the electrons and then continued traveling through uh, space and time. Uh, and that's why uh, 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 we see that as a, a cosmic microwave background coming from all sides to us. It's the so-called last scattering surface that sort of released, was released and then traveled through be, uh, 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 space because the structure began forming. In other words, the atoms began uh, forming the electrons and protons combined into uh, 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 atoms, so the uh, uh, photons didn't really scatter uh, uh, of the electrons anymore. 
So this last scattering surface continued traveling through space and time, and uh, uh, around that time, it was about 3,000 Kelvin, and then due to, the expansion, due to the expansion of the universe, it cooled down to about 3 Kelvin nowadays. And that's what Penzias and Wilson discovered. Uh, of course, the story is much more complex, as you can imagine, but this is just sort of the part that we need now. Uh, it radiates like a black body to a very high precision. Uh, now we know that its temperature, these are three data sets uh, are from three different measurings, two different satellites, uh, about 2.7 Kelvin, and it's isotropic. In other words, it's sort of coming, it's, it's coming uh, to us uh, uh, very uniformly uh, over the sky. It looks very isotropic. It's not completely isotropic. There are sort of two kinds of uh, 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 anisotropies, but uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about that uh, now. They're very important, actually. Um, now, how, how is this? moment in the history of cosmology usually assessed? Well, it's usually treated sort of analogously to sort of a one-shot confirmatory experimental result. It's not an experiment, but it has that sort of a, it's sort of characterized as if it has that sort of a stand, epistemic standing, if you want. And usually when you read textbooks, you will get the impression of sort of inevitability of interpreting the cosmic microwave background in that particular way. Right. Just to give you a few sort of a hints, so from Peacock's uh, uh, 99 uh, 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 book, the fact that the properties of the last scattering surface are almost independent of all the unknowns in cosmology is immensely satisfying. In other words, all these theoretical models became sort of, or their parameters sort of irrelevant in terms of what we actually observed and what we know about the CMB and how we're going to interpret them, right? So in other words, it sort of refuted all the, uh, all the other models, right? And sort of independently, uh, meaning in, in pretty much the way that the experimental evidence in your collider actually does. And some uh, regarded that as the real beginning of physical cosmology for that reason. That's when it begins. It's not sort of a observational guessing work, but really now we have sort of a hard evidence. Well, uh, a colleague of mine and a friend of mine, uh, Milan Cirkovic, and I wrote a paper where we assessed this historical sort of episode of about three decades, four decades, uh, with sort of looking at the details uh, of this history. By the way, Milan is fairly well connected to uh, uh, Oxford. He's associated with Future of Humanity Institute, and his book on uh, Fermi's paradox just came out with the Oxford University Press. It's in, in the uh, bookstore I checked today because he told me to do so. Uh, so really, what really happened is that cosmic microwave background as a sort of a evident piece of evidence gradually was accepted as something that tests uh, with some certainty the uh, uh, hot Big Bang model. So the first step was that the theoretical models were made in the 40s, but there wasn't enough actually uh, 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 um, resources to calculate, do the calculations of the physical implications like the background radiation that was done in the 60s and then there was the discovery of Penzias and Wilson and you had more or less a moderate convergence actually that that was the uh, test, successful test of the hot Big Bang model, right? And then finally a, a kind of a wide or Strong convergence happened only uh, in the late 80s and beginning of the 90s with the COBE satellite that gave us uh, additional pieces of evidence, especially concerning isotropy of and temperature of it, that actually resulted uh, in wide convergence. It didn't happen overnight. So now the question is what happened in the meantime? <laughs> 
Well, what happened is exactly what that sort of a philosophical argument I made uh, uh, in the first half of the lecture would tell you happened. A number of alternatives that people normally don't mention anymore happened. And they were actually developed by prominent physicists. And even more interestingly, sometimes those, those who worked on the hot Big Bang worked on alternative models on the side. And that's exactly what they should be doing in, in a way. So there were just sort of briefly two kinds of uh, uh, interpretations, which you might call moderate and radical. So the moderate ones, they were sort of developed within the, cos uh, the, the, the sort of assumption of the cosmological at the level of the universe validity of uh, 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 relativistic equations. And then uh, radical ones abandoned the relativistic actually model of the universe. What's especially interesting about these moderate ones, they tried to use well-known astrophysical sort of phenomena to explain the origin of the uh, CMB. They didn't really go for these initial uh, uh, phases of the, of the universe at all, some of them. Uh, at least to explain to you, to explain the isotro its isotropy and its temperature, right? So in this group, they are so-called cold or tepid, depending on the temperature that they assume, uh, uh, temperature of the early universe, uh, depending on the ratio of photons to baryons, actually, or the entropy to baryons. Uh, uh, so I, I'll just mention or sort of characterize some of them. Uh, so one of the models suggested that uh, the CMB was radiated by uh, early structure or sort of early objects, usually ca called population three objects. So not in that very early phase, but once the structure started forming, once you had early or first galaxies, uh, the CMB that we see is actually a result of uh, these galaxies, not this early phase. And then they relied, in order to explain the actual temperature of the universe, uh, of the CMB at 3 Kelvin, they also relied on the idea that this thermalization to 3 Kelvin uh, can happen due to the uh, 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 widespread dust uh, in the universe. And then you had models that uh, uh, sort of refined this idea what kind of dust it has to be? Well, very specific uh, uh, grains of very specific structure, chemical structure, and even sort of geometrical uh, shape. Uh, there's a number of uh, attempts of this sort, and at the time they were actually plausible. Some of them were introduced as sort of a toy case, toy models in order to test some of the assumptions of the hot Big Bang model. Uh, they were never really developed to full scale the way that the hot Big Bang model uh, has been uh, developed. Then one of the ideas was that uh, CMB is not really this kind of a last scattering homogeneous surface, but really results from separate, separated uh, uh, discrete sources, right? And that we only see it as kind of a, a homogeneous because our uh, resolving power of our instruments is not good enough. For, for a while, that was the... Uh, then there were other sort of... A, uh, some models tried to actually work out a different uh, uh, account of initial conditions than the hot Big Bang model uh, by introducing various uh, hypotheses concerning the parameters of very early development uh, uh, evolution of the universe. And then one of the models didn't even... Uh, in order to explain the thermalization, didn't even rely on the population three objects nor on uh, thermalization by dust grains, but uh, modeled that as a sort of a, a, a process, a regular process of what will happen actually to a starlight traveling uh, uh, through, uh, 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 through the universe, through space. Uh, on this side, uh, the steady state cosmologies went through so those that actually modeled, uh, like for example, Hoyles and uh, 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 his students, 
uh, went through different stages of the development. One of the ideas, th th there were a number of ideas on that side too. One of the ideas was that actually what we are uh, seeing as a sort of a three Kelvin uh, 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 radiation, isotropic radiation, uh, is uh, coming from the sort of a region of the space of the universe uh, where uh, gravitation uh, is actually turning from sort of a, a positive sign to a negative sign. So it has sort of a, 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 a plus and minus the way that the, uh, 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 electromagnetic radiation has. So the, the, the gravitation is also polarized in that way. It's just that we don't see the other region, <coughs> but at the uh, uh, sort of a, a border limit between the two regions of the universe, this is exactly uh, based on this model what you will, you will see. Uh, you will see isotropic radiation of three, about three Kelvin actually coming uh, right at you. It's one of the ideas. It's a really beautiful model actually, not much discussed, but you know, for all those philosophers who are excited about the simplicity and beauty of models, I mean, we, really, everybody should go for that one at the time, not now, right? Because there were new pieces of evidence that, that sort of showed its weaknesses. There were other ideas, uh, too, if you want to find out about the... You can read our paper, actually, about the details of these various models. The point is that there is a great variation, actually, on what CMB is really evidence of, right? You can... Uh, postulated as sort of something to do with sort of initial kind of a stage in the uh, early universe, something that doesn't have to do with anything with that, uh, uh, something that's actually thermalized due to various sort of regular astrophysical processes that we know uh, very well, and so on, or sort of a, uh, a global property, if you property if you want in in this Hoyle's uh, model. Uh, and at the time, there were sort of various advantages of various aspects of these uh, uh, models compared to the hot Big Bang, especially in terms of the isotropy, for example, and the problem that was became sort of uh, uh, very clear uh, fairly early on. Uh, a number of other uh, advantages or sort of tests, so to speak, of the hot Big Bang model due to the uh, uh, alternative uh, uh, models. Uh, so it's true, it's true, and it's obvious that the discovery of the CMB was a sort of a milestone discovery, but really you can't treat it uh, as a sort of uh, analogous to the experimental evidence. It didn't play that role, really. Uh, and the reason is that uh, you ne never really had sort of a, a robust testability. Uh, uh, in order to, you did improve the evidence sort of incrementally, gradually, but it never really uh, had that sort of a power, so to speak, as sort of a robust testability would, would imply. So we can so conclude a few things uh, from this, probably that, I mean, if you characterize this discovery or sort of similar discoveries as analogous to experimental sort of evidence, uh, this inadvertently sort of boosts the epistemic standing of the dominant view, reinforces it sort of unjustifiably, and you disregard all these uh, uh, alternatives, which they cannot be really disregarded in the same manner uh, and refuted in, in, in which you can do that when you do have experimental uh, evidence or sort of robustly testable uh, 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 um, discipline. Uh, your alternatives can contain uh, all sorts of valuable side ideas, motivations, right? So physical motivations, conjectures. Uh, what's really clear is that you can explore these phenomena sort of piecemeal, not sort of a wholesale. You don't need to build a big sort of a model in order to uh, explore various routes or various uh, ways of explaining that particular piece of evidence. You can do that irrespective of the entire uh, model, and many of these models really did that. Then uh, you can also uh, 
see in some of the examples, like the steady state uh, uh, models, that you can actually develop a very elaborate and elegant uh, um, alternative models uh, uh, that account for the physical facts. You can never really disregard this possibility. Then incorrect models can actually be helpful in identifying certain weak points in your dominant view as well. Uh, and sometimes you cannot also discard the uh, a possible refurbishing of an old model. That actually happened with one of the uh, 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 models uh, with the uh, uh, thermalization uh, uh, by sort of uh, uh, usual astrophysical uh, processes as well. So these are some uh, ways in which you can also, it can, it can point out to certain background assumptions that are not really obvious to those who are pursuing the, the, the model, the sort of dominant model. Uh, also, I mean, this is a really good example. Uh, so new pieces of evidence can sort of uh, uh, make these models more relevant or, or sort of a family of models if not these particular models that were shown to be uh, deficient, actually with sort of new pieces of evidence, uh, this can always uh, happen. So given all this, it's really uh, sort of, how would you treat these alternatives? Well, you don't treat them as sort of a refuted theories, fully refuted theories. Uh, but as a kind of a resource of uh, ideas that you can uh, use, you can further develop, you can use these toy models. Uh, and in general, as sort of a like general epistemological point, really you can treat them as sort of initial dips in a wider pool of possible alternatives. And that's sort of a regular state of affairs, uh, I would say. Uh, in cosmology, and in a sense there is a kind of a duty or responsibility to develop thoroughly the alternatives, precisely because you know that the kind of evidence that you can get uh, uh, in cosmology is not as robust as you can get in the experimental uh, areas of science. So let me just finish with one final remark that concerns the nature of alternatives. So these alternatives I talked about, they are what you could call predictive alternatives. They give you very precise parameters uh, that you can test. You know, they, they differ uh, from the sort of results of the calculations of the dominant model, right? Uh, and then there are interpretive alternatives where that's not so much clear, actually, that you can distinguish them. Uh, so, I mean, to use maybe an uh, analogy with quantum mechanics, so the dif distinction between quantum mechanics and uh, Baumian mechanics would be sort of this different because Baumian mechanics introduces a parameter that quantum mechanics doesn't. Uh, you can't test it, I mean, practically speaking, but at least there is that sort of a distinction. In interpreting alternatives, uh, it's not clear how <laughs> distinguishable are the models from each other uh, in terms of the evidence that you already have, in terms of the evidence you can achieve, or maybe in principle uh, they are not distinguishable. And that seems to be something that's going on actually in current uh, production, let's say, of models, uh, inflationary, especially uh, uh, models uh, within the hot Big Bang uh, paradigm, uh, where you can't really tell, you know, whether these are uh, predictive of it or interpretive uh, um, models. I mean, I'm not quite clear on this. It's just sort of a footnote to the main uh, point. So that's it. So thanks very much, Slobodan, for a really interesting talk to kick off this series. We, we have about 15 minutes now for questions. And if I may, I'd, I'd like to start. I mean, I found the talk very interesting in general. And I think uh, one thing it brings out is we have a tendency
to assume that all authoritative scientific consensuses have the same kind of epistemic standing. Um, whereas, you know, I intuitively that's not the case. And it's interesting to hear that uh, perhaps this view is encouraged a bit in the way that uh, these things get presented even in textbooks uh, by using the metaphor of an experiment for what wasn't really an experiment and so on. My, my question it might reveal that uh, I only have a very basic uh, grasp of philosophy of science. I think of the, the sort of big picture philosophy of science uh, uh, as being characterized at least in part by Popper's idea on the one hand that you have theories put forward and then lots of work done to refute them and they're very sensitive to being refuted or falsified uh, and when they are they get dropped. And on the other hand you have uh, the sort of uh, Kuhn or Imre Lakatos idea where people hang on to theories even if evidence seems to refute them and they, they just keep on trying to explain away the evidence until you get a huge revolution happening. Now I just wondered where, where does cosmology fall on this scale? It, it, I mean it sounds a bit like it's, it's more towards, going to be more towards the Lakatos Kuhn kind of end except it's not quite clear where the revolutions are going to come from given the huge constraints on what we can test and measure. Yeah, that's a great question, something that uh, we've been thinking about. As far as the underdetermination idea goes, right? That's sort of an, like an argument against the kind of a Popperian view and, and the view that there are critical, crucial experiments. You have, you know, two hypotheses and you sort of knock out one of them out of the <laughs> any sort of plausibility. Uh, usually, the, the, sort of the good, uh, the, uh, the underdetermination uh, thesis is supposed to tell you, well, you never really know what sort of hypotheses in the sort of conjunction of the hypotheses uh, uh, you knocked out, right? You never really yeah. know that. Yeah. And then there is the kind of a, a thesis that uh, you can produce infinitely many sort of theories, really, in principle of uh, the same phenomenon, which are you know, sufficiently plausible and so on. Uh, the response, a good response to that is that it may be that you can produce, maybe the case you can produce infinitely many theories, but you can place constraints nevertheless. You can sort of uh, refute or sort of uh, 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 refute particular kinds of theoretical models. Uh, and then you're left with the maybe infinity of you know, other models, but you know that certain properties are not really you know, uh, in play anymore. I think you can do that in cosmology as well. Uh, it's just the extent to which you can do it and the scale sort of uh, in which you can do it is uh, much more challenging than in the experimental science. So in that particular sense, I don't think there is anything different substantially when you compare experimental particle uh -huh. physics and cosmology. That's why I sort of emphasize it's the matter of accessibility and manipulability. But you can actually refute, you know, as much as you can refute in any science that's sort of struggling with, you know, uh, 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 the same kinds of uh, constraints. So that would be sort of a Thank long. you. I, I have a, I have a follow-up question, but I'm going to give it to the floor, and if there's time, I might, might come round to that. Um, raise your hand if you have a question, and do let me bring the mic to you before you go, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I used to be a particle physicist, uh, and there's um, a sort of switch that takes place when people talk about the cosmos. They start to put the cosmos as an object. Um, and is it an object um, or a collection of objects? Uh, I don't see a definition in, in what you presented so far, so I wondered whether you had anything to, to say about that. Thank you. Is it an object? Well, one of the things that I did mention that I think is relevant to your question is that cosmology is bound to deal with the structure you know, that exists in the universe. Right? It's as complex as it gets, really, uh, in many ways. So uh, 
uh, you, you will have to deal with the objects as they're defined by physics, you know, to start with, with by particle physics, where in some sense you could say that electrons and protons are sort of weird objects, right? And then you try to figure out what kind of object or what are the sort of criteria of their identity and so on. So you're going to have to implement that into your cosmological theories, but then you're going to have to deal with sort of all the other scales uh, uh, of it. What comes out at the very end, given that you're dealing with the entire structure, whether that's an object in any sense resembling the objects uh, at the microphysical level, I mean, it's really interesting. It would be interesting to explore what sort of a ideas from, say, process metaphysics we have to say about it, whether they could be helpful or not in understanding actually the sort of more ontological parameters of, the, uh, of cosmology. But so yeah, I mean, that's one direction in which one could think about that. Thanks. Samuel. Thank you very much in, indeed. That was tremendously interesting and a lot to, um, to digest. I have rather a, um, a, a large question to which I think you can only give a very preliminary um, answer, but I'm wondering how, um, so if cosmology as you uh, characterize it could be in any respect continuous with theology, so is there a fruitful field of crossover there or not? Um. There was an early quotation that suggested yeah. that, yes. But yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, in one sense, it's obvious how it could be, or historically how it was, and it probably will be, as Krug had suggested. Uh, and that's sort of a, a, a various... Given that you have a wide space of alternatives that you have to produce, really, if you're kind of very responsible epistemically, terms of understanding the structure of the universe and its beginning, you really will use any help you can find. And one of the resources for sort of understanding uh, uh, very global abstract properties are certainly ideas that sort of originated the kind of a theological realm, so to speak. So, I mean, it's really hard to see how that's going to change, really. Right. Ever, I would say. Uh, so, as a sort of resource I, of ideas. Now, whether there are any more, uh, how would I put it, intricate, or in what intricate ways these ideas could be sort of uh, uh, related and sort of crossing over, that's something I can't really tell you because my knowledge of theology is fairly superficial compared to philosophy of science, but it's something certainly that one could explore, actually. I mean, Krag's book is really great for, for sort of to start exploring these, these uh, uh, issues. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, early on in your talk, you mentioned that there's been a kind of historical development of cosmology from early speculative cosmology in the ancient world to mathematical cos cosmology and now uh, more recently physical cosmology. Now um, I would imagine that part of speculative cosmology was the idea that the universe had some sort of, the, or the cosmos had some sort of purpose or even that there might be a teleology in the cosmos um, and um, I'm just wondering whether those ideas have completely dropped out when it comes to mathematical cosmology and physical cosmology, or whether, or, or whether there might be some way of tying in some of the, the ideas from the ancient world into the, these more modern theories. Yeah, I mean, this is probably another area to explore. Um, there are various uh, concepts of uh, teleology and sort of in, in that philosophers have talked about and um, how these tie to the actual models sort of modern physical cosmology uh, is also something sort of interesting right I mean uh, 
One of the questions that sort of comes to mind is what would be the implications with respect to the, uh, those uh, um, models of the expanding universe that has a sort of beginning in time and those sort of steady state cosmologies, right? That tell you that universe is really something that has been there, you know, uh, uh, forever and will be uh, uh, forever. I mean, th that would be sort of what comes to mind is sort of the relationship between sort of theolo theological, uh, uh, teleological ideas with respect to these sort of uh, uh, sets of uh, models. But again, one would have to sort of explore various ways in which, or it would be helpful in one explores various ways in which philosophers talk about uh, uh, te teleology these days that might actually tie it in more sort of direct way to, to the question uh, questions that cosmologists are interested in. But I wouldn't really sort of pass any judgment on, on this. Might be just sort of interesting. I know we're running towards our official closing time. So, so if anyone needs to leave, please don't feel you can't do so. But we've got another question here, which I'm going to. Thank you indeed. Um, so you presented several unorthodox interpretations of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, can you think of any of these which has been empirically most uh, powerful in explain, to explain astrophysical phenomena and, for example, be compatible with um, the, the, like, uh, the explanation of redshift, which also looks into the past, you know, in, in time? and uh, the Hubble expansion of the universe. So uh, can you think yeah, of Yeah, it, it really depends. Uh, like if you want to see how adequate empirically they were, you really have to see what kind of evidence was available at, uh, at the time when they were produced, right? So they were typically, uh, that, that's the point about, about the underdetermination. They were on a pair with the hot bang, big bang model or better with respect to some key properties like isotropy, for example, right? Because the evidence slowly sort of evolved or gradually from the early uh, uh, Penzias and Wilson discovery to COBE uh, 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 data, data set. And then, uh, like for example, the, the thermalization by grains gave you exact temperature as exact temperature or, or the same temperature that the hot Big Bang actually gave. So it was sort of equally uh, uh, adequate at the time. Um, it also didn't face uh, problems uh, uh, that so the hot Big Bang, mo some, some of them didn't face the problems that hot Big Bang model faced. That it also what was thought to be a problem also with isotropy. So the, the I mean, uh, other maybe than Hoyle's model that I mentioned, uh, uh, they were not really f as fully developed, none of them as fully developed as the hot Big Bang that was developed for like 40 years. You know, there are different stages of its uh, uh, development. Uh, but they were other uh, created uh, to capture the key or to explain the key properties uh, of the CMB at the time. And they were not necessarily part of a bigger, bigger alternative model, such as the steady state, for example, uh, uh, model. So, I mean, they were on a pair when they were produced with respect to the key properties but of the CMB. Some of, them, some of them have for a like couple of decades, actually. Even now, they occasionally appear in sort of prominent, most prominent astrophysics journals. So people are trying, actually thinking about it. And that's what you would expect, given the sort of a nature of the, of the field. Well, one of the previous speakers at this seminar series was Roger Penrose, who, I don't, I mean, I don't understand this stuff properly, but as I understood him, he's interested in a descendant of the steady state theory. Yes, he is one of the, the physicists who is actually exploring one of these uh, uh, alternatives. I mean, currently most sort of younger physicists or cosmologists are working on these, what I called interpretive uh, um, alternatives where you tweak the initial conditions uh, a little bit and in that sense you have an alternative model but they're not as kind of a, a big leap or a radical alternative as the ones that Penrose is exploring.
So I, I know there are one or two questions left in the room, but I'm going to take Chairman's privileges and just end on my follow-up question, which is because it's kind of relevant to the whole series. So one of the things we're really interested in in this uh, seminar series is the relationship between the scientific inquiry and the humanities and indeed the social sciences. And, and one thing that struck me when you were speaking was that it seemed to me that there might be a kind of parallel between the situation epistemically in cosmology and the situation in social science, where for very different reasons you can't do experiments, often for ethical reasons yeah. rather than just practical Sociology reasons. or economics. Do, do you yeah. think there's a possibly a useful parallel to be drawn there? Yeah, the, uh, yeah. yeah I think so. I mean, the, per, the first part of the argument is a very general argument that I think applies to a number of uh, disciplines. It's just that in sort of physical sciences, cosmologies sort of stands out, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And that's sort of a really interesting case. But I think that it's true of archaeology, paleontology, and there are, mm -hmm. there are great parallels between the archaeology, development of archaeology and cosmology. Uh, the so-called selec selection effects that cosmologists were much quicker to sort of realize uh, uh, what, what you are digging out and what's the sample actually that sort of you didn't sort of dig out and then yeah. uh, you draw the sort of uh, sometimes inadequate conclusions, problems like that. So exploring methodology, it's sort of one of the ideas uh, for future research to explore actually methodology uh, or so comparatively of archaeology and, and cosmology as sort of Ah. fields kind of looking at the past actually by reconstructing of course when I said social science I had in mind archaeology in fact primarily yeah. that's, okay so we're gonna have to draw to a close there uh, I'd ask you all to join us for another glass of wine and a chat afterwards if you have the time uh, please do check the humane philosophy website humanephilosophy.com or the Ian Ramsey Center website both of which will give you information on further seminars in this series We'll be meeting again, I think, in about a month. Uh, but until then, I'd ask you to join me in thanking once again Slobodan Perovic for a really interesting talk.